people's lining in. Let's see, so you guys know how to check that. Good, so you can just walk, start. You don't have to start yet, but just yeah. say hi, everybody. Yeah. Welcome and use the Q and A. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the National Biodiversity Teaching. We'll start right away at nine a.m. with Owen. And if you have any questions for the presenter, feel free to put them in the Q and A box. Okay. Well, I, I guess I'm going to see if I can do presenter view here. Okay, everyone can see my screen. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Okay, am I good to start? Yes. Cool. Um, well, hello, everyone. My name is Owen Edwards. I'm a master's student at um, Oklahoma State University. And I uh, just wanted to first thank you guys for having me on board with MBTI. Um, my my roommate was the one who told me about this this project you guys are doing, and I thought it would be a really good opportunity to present some of my my knowledge on frogs. Um, and I guess without further ado, my talk is going to be called "What Makes a Frog Rare." But actually, I'm going to probably more generally just talk about what frogs are at first, and then I'll kind of get into like some of the maybe threats that frogs are facing towards in the presentation. So a little bit about me. So I'm when I was a, a little kid, um, we moved to this neighborhood. And I'm, I'm from Southern Indiana um, and I moved to this neighborhood and there's, there's this little pond like behind my house. So I spent like pretty much every hour of every day, basically in my free time going down to this pond. And what I would do in this pond was collect frogs and turtles. And I was just fascinated by these creatures because, well, I just thought they were super cool. And here's a couple of photos of me um, holding um, what probably some of you guys have seen before are these big bullfrogs. And fast forward to today, it turns out that frogs just aren't really cool organisms. Um, and that's, you know, kind of my biased opinion. I'll, you know, not everyone has to think frogs are cool, but they actually turn out to be perfect model organisms for studying environmental change. So that kind of, you get best of both worlds. Not only are they cool, they're really, really easy to work with. And there's a lot of implications that you can get out of studying frogs. And this is a picture of me holding um, a green tree frog, which is a pretty common frog in the southeastern United States. And then this right picture is me holding what's called a crawfish frog, um, which is one of the rare species in North America, which I'll be able to talk to you guys about in a little bit. And, and then here's a slide about, and I'm just going to go into like kind of what I do for research. So basically what I do um, as a student is I go out and collect frogs in the field. So I'm going to see if these videos work. Hopefully they do. But here's a, a little video of um, what we just call hand capture. So these are those green tree frogs like I showed earlier of me holding holding one. And this is what we call hand capture, where you just kind of go to a pond. You kind of listen for the frogs and you kind of collect them by hand. So this is a video of kind of like what they sound like while I'm actually collecting the frogs. Hopefully that's not too loud. And here's a, another video of me collecting these frogs. And what you can do is sometimes they're, you know, they're green, so they have really good camouflage. So they're really hard to see. And with a lot of frogs, they'll be really, you know, kind of shy if they hear someone or they see a light, they'll just stop calling. So what you can do is you can actually call back and imitate their call. And if you mimic their call, it kind of tricks the frogs into thinking it's another frog and then they'll start calling back. So here's just a little clip of me again out in the field. And I'm kind of, you can hear me making this, this call like, to the best of my abilities and, it ends up um, calling back and I end up finding the frog. So here's this clip. It's kind of cool. Wink, 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 wink. Oh, here we go. Wink, 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 wink. And then, yeah, there it is in the lily pad. Um, and the only reason why I was able to find that frog was because it started calling again. Um, and then the last... Uh, Kind of method that I've used to collect frogs is what we call um, trapping, the trapping method. And these, this is basically what we call uh, pitfall traps, where you kind of dig buckets into the ground, and the frogs basically just fall into the buckets. Um, and this kind of to show you kind of more what this looks like. Oh, uh oh. Um, so here's a diagram of uh, kind of what this looks like. So basically, you kind of set up a fence in the ground. You kind of dig a trench. And you set up a fence and basically what you're doing is you're making a barrier for like where animals are going to be passing through. So let's say hypothetically you got a pond 
well, if you put a fence around that pond and then you dug buckets like every 10 feet, um, when the frogs are kind of emerging for breeding season, they'll end up trying to go to that pond. But what they'll do is they'll hit the side of this fence and then they'll start moving to see if they can go around the fence and they'll end up falling in these buckets that we've like dug into the ground. So this is called, this is what we call like the pitfall trap and drift fence method. And here's a example of one of our study ponds in southeastern Oklahoma. You can see this is, this is like a 900 foot um, long pond. And um, we've ended up getting like over um, like a thousand captures of um, individual frogs, which is really cool. Um, so this is, these are just two different types of, um, you know, trapping methods and capture methods you can use for frogs. Um, and then some of what I do in terms of my actual research is um, a lot of that has to deal with physiology. So what I do is I can measure um, what's called thermal tolerance, which is kind of the lower limits and upper limits of in which frogs can withstand temperature. And basically what that looks like is you kind of put frogs in this, this water chamber and you can heat up the water or you can chill the water and you kind of take that point in temperature in which that frog loses um, locomotion. So once that frog is at a temperature in which it can't basically move around anymore, that's that like temperature in which it can't surpass. So it's like a maximum temperature it can withstand and then there's a lower temperature in, in which it can withstand. And uh, there's, of course, really important implications with that, because if you get that range of temperatures between the lower and the upper limits, that is that whole like thermal breadth in which that frog can basically live. Um, so this is really important in terms of like climate change um, and environmental change, especially with, you know, global warming temperatures. It's really useful to kind of learn what these limits are for frogs. And again, this is kind of I'm going to briefly go over this. This is kind of what it looks like on a curve. So on the on the y axis we call it like you know relative performance but you can put any performance trait on this curve it can be um, life it can be metabolic rate it can be things like again like what I, what I said locomotion and there's a temperature up here called TO which is like the max it's like the best um, temperature in which that frog can perform so at this temperature the frog performs at its best but of course if it gets too hot that frog can't perform anymore um, and if it gets too cold that frog can't perform anymore. Um, so it's really cool. You can see this, this, what we call the thermal breath. And this is that, again, that temperature between the maximum and the minimum. And that's just kind of a diagram to hopefully um, let you guys make more sense of it. Um, and then some of the other stuff I do is relates to morphology. And this is really important for, you know, trying to delimit species, species identification, and also understanding what the functional significance is behind a lot of species traits. And when I say morphology, a lot of that deals with um, studying the frog's bones. So you can see this is a, a radiograph image or an x-ray image of a bunch of green tree frogs. And once you take this image, you're actually able to measure really, really accurately, like how long some of these frogs' legs are, or like how long or how wide their skulls are. And then um, on the right, you can see this is a different um, method for um, studying frog bones, and it's called micro CT scanning. So this basically is a method where you can get a, a bunch of x-rays put together and overlaid on one another, and it creates a 3D image of a uh, frog skeleton. And so this is another project we're working on with um, with skulls. So we're able, and this is a leopard frog skull, so we're able to map certain points on this 3D image, and it's able to tell us a lot of information about that frog skull, which is really cool. And here's an example of kind of what this looks like in a graph. So when I was talking about how this is really important for species identification. So here are four different frogs. Um, let me show you guys kind of like a, a relationship tree or evolutionary tree. So you can see that these four frogs are really, really closely related, especially these three up top. So this is a gopher frog. This is a crawfish frog right here. And then this is a pickerel frog on the left. And what's really unique about these frogs is um, they all use some sort of like burrow or um, underground system in which they basically live for a long period of time. So these gopher frogs live in gopher tortoise burrows. These crawfish frogs live in crayfish burrows. And then a lot of these pickerel frogs live in like caves. There's very, very unique um, things that happen to their morphology that allow them to, I guess, you know, burrow and live in these certain different habitats. And going back to this figure, you can see when we map this out, after we take all these scans, we can see that these species actually fall out a lot differently from one another, despite them being very, very closely related. You can see that the crawfish frog and the gopher frog, you know, there are those burrowing species. You can see that they're a lot closely um, intertwined in terms of their skull morphology, but you can see that things like this leopard frog and this pickerel frog 
they're a little bit further away in terms of being like related in terms of their skull morphology. And that kind of relates back to kind of what habitat and um, some of the um, things are actually utilizing in their environment. So that, that's kind of like a cool thing you can get out of um, using morphology for understanding um, different species and how they interact. And then the last thing I do is what's called building like species distribution models, which is the same thing as if you've ever heard of like a niche model or kind of a habitat suitability model. And basically what this is doing is it's using their relationship between species occurrences. So like where um, species occur. And a lot of this data you can get from like iNaturalist, but it's basically just using coordinates for where the species is found. And then it correlates that or relates that back to like different environmental variables. So then we can then map out like for a lot of species that are not very well documented and not very well surveyed, you can kind of estimate like where the species might be. And then also this is really useful for um, predicting things in the future. So if you're if with climate change being, a, you know, a big deal as um, in the last 20 years, we can kind of predict maybe in the next 40 years where the species might be in terms of their geographic distribution or the range. So this is really, these are really useful tools for kind of estimating what will happen to a species in the future. Um, do we have a, a question? Go for it. Okay, so one of the questions we had was, how does habitat loss impact frog populations? And what are the main causes of habitat loss for the frogs? Yeah, so I, there's a lot of different scenarios in terms of habitat. That's a really good question. There's a lot of different scenarios that happen with habitat loss. Um, some of that I'll probably end up talking about later on in the presentation. So let's hold that thought and then let's see if I answer that question later. But if not, um, feel free to ask again. But I think I'll be able to answer that question. Okay. Um, and there's another question from Elgin High School that asks, are any rare frogs keystone species? Well, that's a really tough question too. So um, if basically what a keystone species is, is a, a species that is um, plays a really important role in the ecosystem. And that role not only is just important, but it's uh, important for other species. So for example, when I was talking about these, this group of frogs right here, um, these frogs live in what's called gopher tortoise burrows. And gopher tortoises are known to be a keystone species because their burrows provide like you know, a ton of, um, a ton of, I guess, environmental niche space for a lot of other species. So in that case, the gopher tortoise is a keystone species, but in terms of frogs, um, I don't know if there's technically a keystone species frog. Um, and I'd probably have to do a little bit of research on that, but as far as I'm concerned, um, most frogs are not keystone species. They're usually kind of the species that um, needs a keystone species because they're using something else from another species like this gopher frog or sorry this crawfish frog for example it uses crayfish burrows so maybe crayfish are the keystone species rather than the the frog itself um, so hopefully that answers your question I'm not super sure there might be like one out there but I can't think of one cool okay and then so I'm just going to go through some basic vocabulary um and we'll start with um, like kind of what are amphibians. So we have three major groups of amphibians. We and and this is again these are these are living day amphibians, and they're called um, the group is called Lysamphibia, and it consists of you know frogs and toads, um, salamanders and Sicilians, which are a really really weird group of amphibian that a lot of people even haven't heard about. But basically, I just kind of wanted to give this slide about like species counts, and this basically these species counts are from two years ago. So two years ago, there were 7,443 frogs, and there was only 767 salamanders, and then there was only 215 Sicilians. But if you fast forward to today, that number has increased um, substantially, right? So we've almost gained 200 species of amphibians since two years ago. And then we've gained almost, you know, 50 new salamanders. So now there's 816 salamanders, and now there's 222 um, Sicilians. So we've gained five more Sicilians. So I think that's really cool and just shows that, um, as time goes on, we're always finding more species. A lot of amphibians are um, unfortunately not super well surveyed because they live in sometimes really remote conditions and they live in very cryptic lifestyles. So it's really hard for you know surveyors to go out and actually find these things. So a lot of them are really, really small, but um, we are still discovering amphibians. And I think that um, is a really cool thing to know that um, there's always something new going around the corner. And it kind of brings me back to you know, this, this talk is obviously on a frog. So what, what actually is a frog? So frogs are, 
basically um, this group that has evolved about probably 350 million years ago. And so they're actually older than mammals or older than turtles. They're older than snakes, crocodiles, and birds. Um, and if you break down this group amphibian, you can see there's, again, these three major groups. Um, and again, like I said before, Sicilians are one of those really weird groups, which they don't have limbs. I know in this picture, it shows them having legs, but they actually don't have limbs. And they're this like worm shaped, like weird creature that lives most of its time underground in most scenarios. Um, so they're a very secretive group. And, and my talk is not on Sicilians, but Sicilians don't really get talked about very much. So I do have an honorable mention slide of um, some pictures of Sicilians just to give you guys some perspective on what these guys are. Um, so they can be both terrestrial and aquatic, um, and they're found in basically most wet tropical regions around the world, except uh, Australia, and, and they're not found in Madagascar. But they, and one of the unique things about these, these guys is a lot of times they have this weird like sensory tentacle right in between the snout and the eye. And no one really knows what it does or how it's worked because they're not very well studied. Um, but again, this is just a very bizarre um, creature. And there's examples of them, again, being aquatic and then being fully terrestrial. But it's really rare to see these in nature because most of the time they are fully fossorial underground. Um, some of them do look like aliens. This one has like a bunch of crazy sharp teeth. And you can see like their skull morphology is incredibly diverse to a lot of, and you can tell them this picture, especially down here, that their skull is kind of modified to be a burrower. It's modified to actually like go down and dig into the ground. So it's, that's pretty cool. Um, so that's the last kind of tip that I have on this group because they're kind of swept under the, the mattress a little bit usually. So, um, and then, so what actually is a frog? So the order is actually called a neuro. And what that means, it's Latin for without a tail. Um, so I know you guys are probably thinking like, you know, the tadpole stage does have a tail. So there are exceptions to kind of what it means to ha not have a tail. But this is usually meaning like the adult stage of a frog. And of course, frogs have a biphasic life cycle, which I'll end up talking about in the next slide. But um, there's also another exception to this, this rule or this definition without a tail. Um, there's actually a frog called the tailed frog. And this is a really cool frog. Um, it doesn't, it's it's almost like a false tail because the tail is not actually a real tail. Um, there's no bones or no vertebrae that come out from the tail. It's actually an extension of its digestive tract. And this is a really weird frog because they use internal fertilization and most frogs obviously use external fertilization. And another weird thing about this frog is they don't actually call. Like most frogs have this unique um, vocal repertoire that they use to attract mates. And this frog kind of is, doing everything opposite for actually what makes a frog. But anyways, that's kind of a, a weird exception to the rule of kind of what it means to be a frog. Um, but of course, frogs do most of the time use external fertilization. So what happens is these frogs will usually implex. So the male will kind of grip the female on her back and that female will deposit her eggs and that, that male will release sperm. And that sperm will then go into the egg and that it'll fertilize the egg. And then later on that egg will develop into um, what we see are tadpoles. And then after some time, those tadpoles obviously um, start gaining legs and they start losing their gills and becoming adult terrestrial frogs. Um, so they start developing lungs and then they become um, more terrestrial rather than more aquatic. Um, and of course there's exceptions to this. There's some frogs that do really weird things like they'll They'll have um, toadlets instead of tadpoles, and that's just kind of something called direct development, which is kind of a little bit different than um, kind of your typical, you know, tadpole stage. But um, there, there's, again, exceptions to everything. Um, but again, most frogs do make these mating calls, and they serve not only to attract other females and mates, but they also serve to kind of warn other males um, that, Hey, like you're kind of in my territory or like back off. Cause this is, this is where I'm calling. So it's, it's served as both a mating call as well as a, a warning signal to, to other males. And this is kind of unique among the vertebrate group because this doesn't really happen a lot of the time with other groups. Like there are some reptiles, there's like a gecko that can call again, birds call, but um, this is very rare among the vertebrate community that um, these animals can make uh, acoustic signals. Um, do we have a question? Oh, yeah, there's a couple of questions. Okay. So from Glenbrook Elementary, Ella is wondering if there are any species of frogs that are endangered. 
Yeah, there, there are actually a ton of frogs that are endangered. Um, and later on, I think um, I, I couldn't really fit all of them into this presentation, but I'll give a few examples of um, some really cool honorable mention frogs that are endangered. So And then, hopefully, hopefully yeah. we'll get there. Yeah, go ahead. and then we have one more question. It was from Lauren Hill, and she was asking how many frogs are poisonous and can you survive touching a poison dart frog? That's a really good question. So I like I love this question. So technically all frogs are poisonous. Um, so uh, there are some frogs that are more poisonous than other frogs. Um, so all frogs have what are called granular glands that are in basically within the, the, the first layer of skin that they have. And they all secrete some level of toxin. Um, but of course there's other frogs that have bigger granular glands and, you know, some toads have what's called parotid glands, which are these two glands that sit right behind the head. Um, and obviously that's going to be more toxic than just kind of like a normal, um, frog, but, um, most poison dart frogs are actually more toxic than other frogs because of kind of what they eat. So they'll eat certain insects that are toxic and those insects will be eating the plants that are toxic. So they're kind of synthesizing toxins from their environment rather than just being born with that amount of toxin, if that makes any sense. So it's very, really variable among um, the diversity of frogs in terms of toxins. But I think that's kind of cool. Like, I didn't know this when I was younger is that all frogs are technically toxic at some level. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. And then there was one more for right now. We had Stephanie Asari from Elgin High School. She was asking, um, what are the various adaptions that enable frogs to live in both water and on land? That's a really good question too. So most of those adaptions are going to be based around, um, probably around the skin. Um, so there are some frogs that have really semi-permeable skin, um, which just means that their, their skin allows them to easily diffuse molecules, um, rather than other frogs, they have kind of more tough, rough skin, and they're kind of more adapted to maybe like more of like a desert habitat. In that case, there's different levels of physiology in which frogs have that can enable them to retain water. Um, and to kind of reduce that uh, impact of among like evaporation. So that's a lot of it has to do with physiological adaptation. Um, so that's kind of, I think what I would say to answer that question. Cool. Good questions. Um, and then I'm going to real quick, um, since we're talking about calls is give you guys just a few clips of kind of what frog calls sound like. So this is a really common frog called a Northern leopard frog. And this is kind of what this guy sounds like. So you notice it's kind of like clicking and kind of like the snoring sound. And um, these frogs are actually really cool because they kind of sound like if, if you're in a big chorus of them at night, they kind of sound like chuckling or laughing. And it kind of sounds kind of creepy. But once you realize it's a frog, it's not as creepy anymore. But I thought that was, um, again, this is a really common frog that's found um, pretty much all over um, the United States or a big portion of the United States. And then... Let's go to this next example. This is an Eastern Spadefoot toad. Um, so this is a drastically different sound. Um, it kind of sounds like a quonk, quonk sound. I'll give you guys a clip of this. Kind of another unusual, kind of another unusual sound. But these are, again, every frog species has a different um, um, unique call. And they're all, I think, really cool to listen to at night once they're in chorus. And then, of course, there's um, not all frogs uh, utilize calling for signaling. There's some frogs um, like this genus that they actually can signal um, with their feet. Um, so it's kind of a visual signal rather than a call. And they can also call, but this happens when some frogs are in environments where it's super loud. So a lot of like streams and rivers have like waterfalls um, and where the, their habitat is. And it can be really hard for frogs to, to hear another frog calling. So they'll utilize on what's called a foot flag and they'll kind of like move their foot up and down and if a frog can't hear that frog calling can at least see that frog calling from a distance so this kind of again shows that frogs don't only utilize acoustic signals but they can also utilize visual signals like a foot flagging and real quick i'll show you a little clip of kind of what this frog looks like um doing a, a foot signal the frog. Frog. he calls out to attract a mate But when his peeps are drowned out, the male has a backup method. If you can't be heard, 
then a little leg wave might work. So that's just an example of kind of what that looks like in nature. And, um, and it's kind of cool because this they've, researchers have found that these frogs do this primarily to um, warn other males, not really to attract females. So this foot flagging behavior is primarily used um, as like a territorial signal rather than an attraction signal. Um, so it's really cool that, you know, researchers are able to find like which signals mean um, what. And then another cool thing that I, I read about these frogs were like, so they have these dual vocal sacs that both come out at the same time, but this for in this frog species, it can control which vocal sac is inflated. And um, that is, I guess it means different signals. So it, um, if it can use one signal or sorry, it can use one vocal sac um, a certain way if a frog's in the direction where it can see it versus it can use the other one in another um, direction. So they can control, I guess, which vocal sac they want to use, which is super cool. Um, most frogs do have a singular vocal sac, but again, some of them do have like two dual vocal sacs. So it's it's really variable in the in the frog community. Um, and then lastly, probably the biggest synapomorphy or like trait that all frogs share is really what comes down to their skeletal morphology. Um, so they basically, all frogs have what's called a Eurostyle, which is basically just a bunch of vertebrae that are fused together and they form like one long bone. Um, and this actually explains why frogs don't have a tail when they become an adult. And so if you compare frogs with salamanders, I think, so salamanders have about 12 to 18 um, quadral vertebrae. And going back to Sicilians, Sicilians have 95 to 285 quadral vertebrae, but frogs only have um, usually eight to nine. Usually they have nine. There's some frogs that only have eight. Um, but they also, another unique thing about frogs, they don't have any lower teeth um, on their lower jaw. It's only on their upper jaw. So I'll show you what that looks like. Here's a here's a scan that we took of the gopher frog that uses those gopher tortoise burrows um, as refugee. And you can see that this is a scan that we took from that um, kind of fancy um, method set up. You can see the teeth on the top on the ridge of the skull. So the frogs do have teeth, but they're only on the upper mandible, not the lower mandible. Um, so these this is a really cool skull because it's really, really wide um, and very narrow at the at the tip. And, and this is just an example of one of our scans. But yeah, that just shows the teeth. And going kind of more on this diversity um, ramp is that um, they're just, in, there's an incredible diversity of frogs. They all look different. Um, some of them look really, really weird, while some of them look very, very beautiful. Um, here's some examples of like more truffle species. Um, so this is a black rainy frog. Um, they have like really cool, they're known for their, obviously their looks, but they also can, in defensive situations, they kind of blow up their bodies. So they kind of look like a balloon. So they're, they're really cool species. Here's a Brazilian horn toad. Um, they're kind of known for being really good at camouflage and blending into leaves. Um, this is a purple frog from India. So this is a really weird species that was described not super long ago, um, but they're primarily burrowers. They're known for like being super cryptic and hard to find because they're basically underground most of their lives. Um, this is an Indian bullfrog. Again, super pretty frog. It's all yellow and it has these like cool dual vocal sacs. So when it's calling, it just looks really cool with the yellow contrasting with their blue vocal sacs. And then here's a really weird frog too. This is called a, a Suriname toad. And these are fully aquatic frogs, but the female basically like puts the eggs on her back and the tadpoles, um, or actually they're their toadlets that come out, but the, the toadlets are basically live their lives um, on the mom's back. And then eventually when they're ready to metamorph, they come out of their um, the mother's back. And I think that's kind of gross, but super cool species. And then of course we have dart frogs. So frogs can come in all different colors. And um, a lot of them tend to be very charismatic species. And going, so then those are kind of more tropical species. Here are examples of more kind of dry adapted species. Um, we generally think of toads that are being more dry adapted. Um, so the top left, we have a green toad um, found in the United States. Here's a cane toad that's native to um, South America. We have spade foot toads. These are very cryptic too. They're, they live underground for most of the time of the year. This is, an, this is a desert rainy frog. So it's similar to the species that we talked about here, but it's more desert adapted. And then we have things like the Colorado River toad, and then we have Australian tree frogs, which are 
um, a little bit more dry adapted than your tropical species of tree frogs. They can kind of withstand more drought-esque um, um, situations. But you can kind of see a trend when you get to frogs that are more kind of based in the tropics or that they're more kind of based on their aquatic lifestyles. They tend to have more coloration than frogs that are kind of more, I guess they live more in like desert environments or they live underground because really, and again, this is with the purple frog, you'll notice that this is a strictly burrowing frog and it doesn't really have a lot of color because you don't really need a lot of color if you're underground all the time. So that kind of explains why a lot of these burrowing frogs, again, with the spade foot, it's strictly a burrowing frog. You'll notice that it doesn't really need a lot of coloration because it's kind of a waste of energy. You don't need a lot of color if no one's going to see you, right? Um, so that's kind of cool, like trend you see often. And this is an honorable mention frog, the turtle frog. Super weird species of frog. Um, it's just the whole thing, the dome-shaped head, black beady eyes. This thing looks like an alien. It's it's bizarre. Um, and so these guys are native to Australia. And there's like very little information about these guys. Like there's been not very much research done on them because they're so hard to find. They only come out for like a few days or like a week of the year. And then they go. And again, this is another burrowing frog. They're kind of built to be a burrower. Um, and they are basically a termite specialist. They eat termites in the wild. And another cool thing about this frog, it's just weird. It's Again, they have what's called direct development. So they, they don't have a tadpole stage, rather the tadpole stage is within the egg. So when the eggs hatch, it's these little toadlets that come out. So it's almost like a, a premature frog coming out of the egg, um, super weird. But again, this is a really bizarre species that I thought I'd like to share with you guys. Um, and then we have obviously really cool examples of camouflage and frogs. Um, so on the left, we have a Malayan leaf toad. This guy looks just like a leaf. You know, you, you would be super hard to find this guy in the wild because they blend in super well. Um, and then the, down here, this is just a typical ranid species. You can see that a lot of frogs are green. They can blend in with the green vegetation. Um, down here is what we call the mossy frog. They're, I think they're native to Asia and they're really cool because they have like, they have like tubercles and texturized skin that actually mimics the moss and what you see on like tree trunks. So these are really hard to find, um, but they serve as, again, to, you know, protect themselves against predators and also to like ambush their prey. Um, and then this is probably maybe a species, maybe some of you are familiar with, this is a gray tree frog, which is another very common species in the United States. And again, they can blend very well with bark. Um, and again, their camouflage is very largely dependent on what habitat they're in. So you'll notice that frogs that are honest and that live in a certain habitat tend to match that um, background in which they are in. Um, and then uh, this is my, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, we have a couple questions. So from Laurel Hill Elementary, they were wondering how long is the typical lifespan of a frog? Yeah, that's, that's also a very interesting question because it really depends on the species. Um, I know people say like in captivity, things always live a little bit longer. Um, but I think if you were to average everything together, frogs don't really live that long. I would say maybe from five to eight years is probably your average lifespan of a frog. Some frogs can live longer than that, um, but some frogs live way shorter than that. There's some frogs that only live like a few years. Um, so it really depends on the species of frog. Um, and of course, in the wild, like most frogs don't live as long as they actually could because they end up getting preyed upon or um, things can just happen, right, in terms of how they interact with the environment. So um, it's a good question. And then from Sycamore Trails Elementary, Gianna asked, how big is the largest bullfrog? Okay, um, let's the let's hold off on that question for a second because I have a slide coming up about the large frogs that might like help you guys under, or understand like how big a frog can get. So let's hold off on that one too. That's a good question though. Okay, so here's the bird poop frog. This is my honorable mention in terms of camouflage. So this frog has evolved to look like bird poop. Okay, so that's super cool, super weird. Um, but it, it literally mimics bird dropping. So you can see that in this in this bottom photo. Um, these There's three of them here. So there's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. And they're on these rocks or these logs. And you can see the, um, the birds have been pooping on these logs. And they perfectly blend into this bird poop. Um, so what this does is it looks really unappetizing for predators, but also just makes them hard to see. If you look like bird poop and there's bird poop everywhere, it's going to be really hard to find these frogs. So again, this is just a really cool frog that's found in Southeastern Asia that literally mimics um, poop. So I thought that was really, really cool.
Um, and then let's talk about dart frogs. So we obviously know that dart frogs are really, really colorful. They come in all different colors. Um, they're mainly found in South America and Central America. And they kind of utilize um, what we call aposematism, which is basically a warning coloration. Um, and it basically usually involves colors like yellow, oranges, and reds, but it's usually colors that contrast with the background. So these frogs, unlike the camouflage frogs, these frogs do want to be seen by predators because they're, they're, they're signaling, their color is signaling that, hey, like I'm not going to be good to eat. I'm going to not taste good. And you're going to get like sick if you eat me. Um, and a lot of animals actually learn, they'll actually end up eating a dart frog. And then they'll learn that, oh my God, like that made me sick or like, I almost just died from eating that frog. I'm never going to eat that frog again. Um, so that's, that's kind of why we see um, these really cool, um, really bright, vibrant colors of these dart frogs is because a lot of them are toxic and that helps them um, not only be bold and, but it helps them not be afraid to like predators. This, again, this is a signal that is telling the predators, like, I am not going to be fun to eat. Um, And then this is another, this is a specific species um, that is the very, probably the most toxic um, frog in the world. And they're known to be the most toxic vertebrate in the world. Um, so this is in the genus Phyllobates. Um, these are called the golden poison dart frogs or poison arrow frogs. So they have enough poison to kill about 10 to 12 people. So this is something you wouldn't want to touch in the wild because it, you could be at serious risk of, you know, falling, you know, sick or even dying. Um, but again, these frogs are basically getting their toxins, like I mentioned earlier, from, from the insects they eat. So a lot of these frogs eat these ants that are really toxic, and they can kind of synthesize that toxin um, and become very potent. And um, this is actually a really cool frog because um, back in the day, indigenous people that lived in Colombia would actually collect these frogs and they put them, they put the toxins on the tip of their arrows. So they kind of like use the frogs to cover the tip of their arrows, and they'd actually hunt with those arrows. Um, And it would actually kill um, the animals they were hunting a lot faster than without having that toxin. Um, so it's super cool. This is um, just a really cool frog and there's one that everyone should know about. And then frogs can be really, really small. So the frost, the smallest frog species was discovered in 2012. And it's not only the smallest frog species, but it's the smallest vertebrate ever discovered. So this frog is smaller than basically any fish species out there. Um, and they're pretty much the size of like half of what your um, pinky fingernail is. So you can see this is not a quarter, this is a dime. So you can see this is the tip of a, a pencil. Um, the species is incredibly small and um, perhaps why it took so long to discover the species is because it's just really hard to see on the ground. These frogs live on leaf litter and they blend really well being brown um, and they eat like the smallest insects in the world. So um, if you're A frog this big, you have to adapt um, um, to which prey you're going to eat. And they've obviously filled in a really cool niche of, you know, being really small and eating very, very small prey. And then frogs can be really big. So this is called the Goliath frog. So this, these are similar to bullfrogs in size. Um, so bullfrogs can get um, really, really big. On the top of my head, I don't know what the record bullfrog size is, but I've seen bullfrogs before as big as um, kind of like kind of that out i guess I'm trying to think of i've seen bullfrogs that are basically if you were to stretch it out they'd be as big as like um kind of the width of like a soccer ball these guys are actually even bigger these are the goliath frogs they are found in west africa um and they can reach up to over a foot long um so that's similar to bullfrogs but these guys kind of beat bullfrogs out of being the biggest frog in the world um and this species unfortunately is um endangered in the wild And it's mainly endangered due to like extent of, uh, extensive hunting from humans for food. Um, and they're also affected by things like deforestation and kind of like dam construction. Um, and there's also a lot of weird things happening with them in the pet trade. Um, and I think there's like a few hundred frogs that are kind of sent out to the U.S. or that used to be sent out to the U.S. for like frog jumping competitions. So this is a really... Um, bad rat species in terms of being, you know, affected by by humans and um, other sorts of environmental damage. Um, so unfortunately, this frog is not doing super well, but there are like a lot of protection acts in place for this frog. Um, and then lastly, for like vocabulary, um, I know someone's probably asking, like, what's the difference between a frog and a toad? And I have like kind of a unique perspective on this. So, so a frog often refers to like a smooth skin aquatic jumper.
So really what a frog is based off of is what we call a true frog. And this is basically a group in this family called Ranidae. And a lot of times you'll see that there's a genus called Rana, and this includes things like bullfrogs, green frogs, which are common in the U.S., um, leopard frogs, which I've mentioned earlier, pickerel frogs. So all these frogs look very similar. They're all in the same family, and they all have that same like kind of pointed snout look. They all have very smooth skin, and they're like pretty much aquatic for most of their lives. Um, and this is why Kermit the, like, Kermit the Frog is a true frog. So Kermit the Frog was based off of basically all these frogs I just mentioned, like these true frogs in, in the genus Rana. And so and this is another example. So frog and toad. Frog is pretty much based off of what a true frog is. Um, but if you think of, of a toad, we often think of like something that's warty, like dry skinned, terrestrial. Um, they're kind of based on this family called Bufonidae. And so toads kind of all have that same look to them. They kind of, they're kind of all like kind of fat. They kind of have that drier, warty skin. Um, and you can see like even in the characters, they kind of put warts on toad here versus frog. Frog doesn't really have any warts. Um, but I kind of want to, the take home message is that there is really not a clear difference between a frog and a toad. So we have a gray tree frog here, but you'll notice that the skin's kind of warty. Um, and then you'll have a spade foot toad and the skin's actually very smooth. So I, my take home message is using the term in neurons or just frogs in general. So, so basically it's not all frogs or toads, but all toads are frogs. So I think if you were to call toad a frog, that's perfectly okay. Toads are frogs because they're in that one group. Um, so I, 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 I know this is kind of confusing, but um, that kind of hopefully helps you guys figure out like, is there really a difference between a frog and a toad? Not really, because they're all a part of the same like bigger idea group. Um, and then this gets me into like what my talk's really about and it's, you know, are frogs rare? Like what makes a frog rare? Um, so the definition of like rare is something that is not found in large numbers. And because of that becomes interesting or valuable. So we think of things that are rare, um, to people, you know, obviously like gold and diamonds, um, they're very rare to find in nature. You know, um, if they weren't super rare people, they wouldn't be super expensive and people really wouldn't want that. Um, I guess that they wouldn't really find those things valuable. Um, but of course, this can be very heavily dependent on sp specific location, time of the year. Um, certain things have better value than others due to the market. Um, and in nature, we'll see really good examples of things that have like genetic mutations. So this is a albino uh, crocodile um, and the, or about albino alligator. And you'll see that they have one at you know Florida Zoo. And it's a very rare animal because it's a very rare genetic mutation. In the wild, this this thing probably wouldn't survive to become an adult because it would probably get preyed upon at a young age because it's really easy to see being white. But um, again, this is a very rare mutation which happens um, and it makes this animal, again, kind of valuable in a way. And so like going back to frogs, or this is now a tortoise, sorry, I'll quickly go over this tortoise. So And this was... This is a tortoise. His name is Lonesome George. Um, he was kind of known to be one of the rarest like creatures in the world um, because he was the last one of the species. So in, in back, back in the early 1900s, there was a lot of pirates that would go to this island called Pinta in the Galapagos Islands off the west coast of Ecuador. And um, they would kind of harvest and source these tortoises and they depleted their populations significantly. And then later on, I think 50 years later, they also released a bunch of goats on the island and these goats just ate up all the resources for um, all the tortoises that have evolved to be on that island for, you know, millions of years. And basically what happened was the National Park basically eradicated all the goats from this island and they basically didn't find any of these tortoises. And this is, again, there's like 18 different species of Galapagos tortoises. This is just one of them. Um, and I think not super long after that, they went back to this island and they found one tortoise left. Um, and it's, they named him Lonesome George because he was the last one of the species. Um, and it's really sad because they they took him back to the main island, Santa Cruz, and they put him in this like kind of rehabilitation center um, or this like kind of outreach station. And they tried to make him mate with like other subspecies that are kind of related to him, but not super related. But he was never able to like mate with these other subspecies. And he ended up dying in 2012. Um, but, you know, this is probably one of the rarest animals um, that has, you know, again, this is not the rarest animal ever, but this is an example of something that is extremely rare. There's only one left at one point in time, but now this species doesn't obviously exist anymore. So that's kind of the story behind Lonesome George.
And um, this gets me back into kind of, you know, back to frogs. So like what makes a frog rare? Um, so if you were to go to a pond and if you were to see like 15 to 20 frog species and you did a big survey and you documented all the species that were there and you took down all the numbers and you were to say, okay, like, you know, these obviously aren't rare in this pond. That's good. But if you were to go back to that pond two years later and you were only find two, you know, something might be going on, whether that be climate change related, whether that might be disease related, whether that might be poaching related. So you might think in this scenario over time, things can become more depleted and more rare. And the question is like, what is causing this to happen? Um, and this gets me to the example of the, the golden toad story. So there's this really cool species that was described in the sixties called the golden toad. And they lived in Costa Rica in this very limited geographic range um, called the Monteverde cloud forest. And uh, they would spend all their time in the roots under trees underground. And for like a week, they would come out to breed during the wet months. And they kind of kind of pool together in these vernal pools. And all the males are this bright orange color. So you'd see them all over the place. And they come, they breed. The females were a little bit different looking. They had this like black and kind of spotty red um, flicks and spots on them. But they come out in these like mass numbers to breed. And they go right back down underground. Um, and kind of... Unfortunately, what happens is, and so in 1987, um, a researcher went back there to do some research and she counted 1500 of these toads, um, uh, all these bright orange toads on the ground. And then a year later, she goes back to her study site and she only found 10 of those toads, um, which is really weird. Um, he went from 1500 to 10, that's like a 99% drop in the toad population. And then a year later, she goes back and there's only one toad. There's only one toad she finds. And again, there's, she looked everywhere. This whole forest is about three miles um, in radius. There's, it's not super big, so it's pretty easy to survey, but she was only able to find one toad. And then a year later, no toads, all the toads are gone. Um, and then after continuing to continue with survey efforts, going back and forth to the site during their breeding, it's never been seen again. So in 2004, um, they were actually declared dis um, extinct. And this is pretty shocking. And it, there's a lot of controversy related to actually why this toad went extinct. A lot of the theories are that it could have been, it could have been its restricted range, like airborne pollution. It could have been global warming. It could have been uh, kind of a, a disease outbreak. But again, this is kind of those things that are happening to amphibians. Um, and this is something that doesn't hasn't only happened to this toad. This is a very famous example of what can happen to um, frogs that are, you know, obviously becoming super rare and that can be wiped off the, the planet. Um, and then you'll have situations where you might go to a pond, you might see multiple species of frogs. So um, this is what we kind of call like species inter interactions. And these are kind of more real life scenarios. So you might go to a pond um, and you might count three different species. And basically what those species are doing is they're pretty much competing for all these different resources, um, like whether that be food or territory or space, um, and then also predation. So other frogs can eat other frogs. And if you're a small frog versus a big frog, like I'd be scared for the small frog because bigger frogs are known to eat smaller frogs. So again, it's not a perfect world. Frogs aren't just, you know, sitting in the pond, minding their own business. Things are interacting with each other. That's kind of the point I'm making. Um, so I'm going to play this clip. <clears throat> this is that pond I was telling you guys about. So I have, a, I have a video clip of different frogs calling. And I guess you should, um, while you're listening to this video, you should try to think about how many frogs are calling this pond. It's kind of like playing a little game here. So try to try to count how many frogs are calling in this pond. And when I say how many frogs, I mean how many different species of frogs. So let's see if you guys can get this. <laughs> Okay. So um, if you guess three different species, you're correct. Um, so there was three different species calling there. There was bullfrogs, there was leopard frogs, and then there was also a really cool frog called a Cajun chorus frog. So the Cajun chorus frogs were making those like click sounds in the background and the bullfrogs were making that moom, moom sound and then the leopard frogs were making that truckling sound. Um, so the, the point of this slide is to say that, yeah, again, there are multiple frog species that can be in a place, but there's some species that might be more rare than others um, considering those species interactions, right? So these are Cajun chorus frogs they are really, really small. And 
you might actually consider this frog more rare than other species because not only are they maybe not in greater, and maybe they're not in the numbers like these leopard frogs are, but they're also really, really, really hard to find. They're actually so hard to find. You can hear them all over the place, but when you go down to look, you'll not find them because they're actually hiding under things like vegetation. Um, and they're very, very cryptic. And once you get too close, they'll kind of retreat back into that vegetation. So they might, there might be situations where frogs are actually out of place, but they're just so hard to find that it's really hard to kind of justify whether they're rare or not. And this kind of brings me to my example of crawfish frogs this is another species I study. So crawfish frogs are one of the species that are, they're considered the rarest species in North America. And this is mainly due to their cryptic nature. So they spend basically 11 out of the 12 months of a year underground in these crayfish burrows. And that's how they get the name. So they live in these crayfish burrows underground. Um, and then they come out for like a week or two and breed, and then they go right back down in the burrows. So they're, they're a super unusual frog. And what makes this frog super rare is maybe not that it's actually declining, but just because it's super, super hard to find. It's a very secretive species. Um, and these burrows that they're in can be like up to uh, 3,000 feet away. So they'll travel all the way from their crayfish burrow that they're occupying all the way to the pond, and they'll go all the way back to the burrow that they were once in. Um, so this is a super cool species. You can see here's a picture of one at the bottom in that crayfish burrow, and they'll literally sit there and they'll be kind of like the ambush predators. So they'll wait for like insects to kind of go on top of the burrow and then they'll just come out and eat them. So they're super cool. Um, they also have really cool defense mechanisms in which they'll kind of lower their head and kind of if a snake or something were to grab this frog, it kind of lowers its head and it kind of widens its body and it becomes like stuck in that burrow so nothing can pull it out. So this is, again, a really cool species, really hard to study because of the cryptic nature behind the species. And it been probably what makes this frog more rare than it just being really hard to find is actually is going through a lot of declines in parts of its range. So here's a map of the United States, the, kind of like the central United States. And you can see that the red counties indicate crawfish frog populations that no longer exist anymore. So these red locations are populations that went extinct. The blue are populations that are that they're there and the orange are populations that are in decline. So you can see that, you know, a good chunk of their range is now completely gone. Um, so they're basically functionally extinct in a lot of their range. Um, and again, this is likely due to a lot of habitat destruction. Um, and a lot of the time, like there's a lot of issues related to conversion of like natural prairie and natural grassland to more like pasture land and farmland. And uh, if you're like a tractor and you're kind of mowing this, you know, native grassland, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be disrupting those burrows. So it's kind of like the main argument there is like once you're converting this land, you're not only, you know, you're not only converting, you know, grass to no grass, but you're also destroying probably burrows. And that happens with the tilling, you know, these machines are going into the ground. They're probably digging up these burrows. Um, disrupting like good crayfish habitat, which these crawfish frogs need in order to su survive and um, be in. So this is just an example of a frog that gets, you know, not only is rare, but is undergoing declines for a bunch of different reasons. Hey, um, have questions. Is it yeah, okay? Go for it. Yeah, of course. So the first one is from Glenbrook Elementary. Natalia is wondering if you have a personal favorite frog and why is it your favorite? Yeah, so my favorite frog is the crawfish frog. Um, and I, I, that's really good timing. So this, the reason why it's my favorite frog is, well, not only is their ecology really cool, like I said, they're, they basically are in burrows for most of their life, <clears throat> but they're just really, really pretty. You know, this frog is to me, this, this whole reticulated pattern. Um, there's so much unique things about this frog that I just like kind of have fallen in love with. And again, I'm biased because a lot of, I'm actually researching this frog too. So I've seen a lot of them and <clears throat> be able to hold them before. But again, I think that's kind of what makes me like, like this frog the most out of all the frogs, but my mind might change later on. Like if I were to maybe go to a different country and look at other frogs, I might be like, okay, like this is actually my favorite frog now. Um, but right now it's crawfish frogs. So good question. We also had from Glenbrook Elementary, Gigi was asking what's the most poisonous frog? Most poisonous frog. So that most poisonous frog is going to be that <clears throat> that golden dart frog I showed you. They have the drop for drop. They're, I think, considered the most toxic vertebrate in the world, but they're able to kill about 10 to 12 uh, people. So that's probably the most toxic frog um, that I'm aware of. Um, so it's, you wouldn't want to touch one, that's for sure. Well, not want to touch one in the wild. They're totally harmless in captivity because they need the ants to be toxic. <laughs> 
Okay. And then from Bill Hawthorne, they were wondering, is foot flagging always in addition to calling or do some foot frogs only foot flag? Bill, that's a really good question. So yeah, so the foot flagging is in addition to calling usually in most scenarios. Um, again, there's there's something called multimodal communication and it's where frogs can utilize both acoustic signals and visual signals. And a lot of frogs actually utilize this type of signaling. Um, foot flagging isn't the only example. Um, frogs calling and inflating their vocal sac is actually a signal within itself. So when a frog is basically approaching, a female frog's approaching a male frog, it's actually not just hearing the calls, but it's actually most of the time seeing that vocal sac inflate and deflate, which can then correspond to a different type of signal. Um, but that, if that answers your question, Bill, I hope it does. That's a good question. Okay. And then from Glenbrook Elementary, Kaylee would like to know what happens to the frogs when water freezes and frogs live in the frozen water. Yeah, so there are some frogs that are, yeah, that's a really good question too. I, I've seen some frogs that are able to withstand extremely cold temperatures. So there are a lot of frogs that are able to, they're actually adapted to, you know, some level of freezing. Um, and that has to do with, um, again, their physiology. Um, so there are some frogs that can probably tolerate certain, um, it depends how long it's frozen for, but there's some frogs that can tolerate a little bit of freezing. Um, but I don't think it's over super long periods of time. And uh, most frogs actually go underground um, and kind of like hibernate in a way to kind of not be actually frozen. Because um, if a frog is fully frozen, it's obviously not able to like pump blood and do basic physiological functions to maintain its life. But there are some frogs that can like kind of freeze in the outer layer of their of their skin. So that's pretty cool. Um, last one we have right now is from Philip and Katie from Elgin. What's the strongest, what's the strangest frog sound you've ever heard? And if you want to like describe it or mimic it. <laughs> Yeah, so I'd probably have to say crawfish frogs again. I know this is this is like my answer to everything, but these frogs, I wish I had a clip for you guys. These frogs sound super bizarre. They have such a low like frequency call. It sounds like a really it sounds like a really low frequency snoring sound. So if you were to hear it, it would sound like really creepy. But I don't think I can even replicate it. It's so so if you so I want everyone to go search crawfish frog sounds. And if you look it up, you'll kind of know what I'm talking about. That would be probably be the weirdest frog call, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. Cool. So I, I know we're kind of running out of time. So I'll try to be quick about um, some of these other slides. Um, but my, kind of the main point here is that almost half of uh, percentage of amphibian species worldwide have become threatened or endangered at some level. Um, and a lot of these things have to do with some things I mentioned earlier, like habitat loss, like things like pollution, there's disease, there's also invasive species. And then we have things like climate change. Um, and, you know, all other animals are actually getting affected by this list of um, environmental changes that are on this slide. But, you know, frogs are definitely hit the hardest or amphibians in general are hit the hardest because they're super sensitive to their environment. You know, they have semi-permeable skin, they're ectothermic, so they're, they're, basically their temperature is reliant on external temperature. And like, you know, mammals, we can regulate our own temperature for frogs is really dependent on the environment that they're in. Um, and then again, they have these biphasic life cycles. They have a tadpole stage and an adult stage, and it makes them a lot more sensitive than other animals. And so what we're, what we're seeing in, in recent years is disease outbreaks. This is called bet Betrachochytridium dendrobatidis. And this is, we just call it BD or a chytrid fungus. And this is a famous photo taken in California. Um, and these are kind of the last um, individuals of a frog population um, in a species called the yellow-legged frogs. And these guys are obviously just kind of laying there motionless in the water. Um, and this is kind of a result of what this disease can do to these frogs. Um, and this is, again, these are really sad pictures, but basically what this, what this disease does, it's, so it's a fungus and it actually kind of hijacks this frog skin um, and then it kind of shuts down their immune system. So frogs, also, you know, not only are they getting most of their oxygen through their lungs, but a lot of frogs can get oxygen to their skin um, via diffusion. So what happens is this fungus attacks the um, outer epidermal layer of the skin, and it can actually cause a lot of respiratory um, and diffusion issues that are happening um, at the skin level. And, and then this can result in mass frog die-offs when this disease actually gets transported to um, certain areas of the world. Um, and it's kind of thought that this disease is kind of spread again by human activities, such as like pet trade, um, even people doing research. Um, and this is obviously like really bad because this is likely driven, you know, over 200 amphibian species to extinction or at some endangered level. So this is, again, 
very sad, not, not to be traumatic, but um, here's a cool map of kind of what we see in um, diversity terms, but the red indicates species that are extinct or critically endangered, while the orange represents species that are endangered or vulnerable. And you can see this trend where you have a lot of species in kind of near the equator. And this is because there's most frog species that are found in the world are found near the, near the equator. So you'll see that we have a thousand species here. We have 700 here, 400 here, a thousand here. And this is the reason why we're seeing all these mass die-offs and mass numbers of frog, um, frog and frogs being endangered um, near the equator versus like kind of near the poles. Um, but again, this is kind of the trends that we're seeing um, today. We're seeing big numbers of frogs declining um, kind of near the equator. And that's likely due to the species diversity being really, really high in those locations. Um, but to kind of end it off is, you know, not all frogs are doing bad, you know. So this is an example of a frog that's actually able to withstand changes in climate change. So these are called green tree frogs. These are one of my study species. And we're actually seeing that this species is able to um, actually move its whole entire range um, to withstand changes in temperature. So as a globe warming species will change their distributions, they'll kind of go towards higher latitudes to stay within their like thermal boundaries. And actually my research is finding that these frogs are adapting really, really well to um, not only by moving to these other locations, but actually by adjusting their, their thermal tolerances to these new localities. So again, some frogs are able to withstand some of the environmental change that we're seeing today. And I just wanted to kind of wrap things up and say, again, no, not all frogs are rare. This is kind of a presentation to give you a little bit of perspective on some of the frogs and what their threats might be in nature. Um, it's kind of the kind of the point I want to make is that there are also a lot of frogs that are obviously affected by um, a lot of things that are happening in terms of um, threats, environmental change. Um, and I think what we can do as people is, I think education is probably the most important thing um, in terms of, you know, making uh, frogs, you know, do better in the wild. So I think bringing awareness to frogs, you know, telling people why they're cool and informing threats in the face of climate change will kind of facilitate conservation strategies and habitat protection and disease management and things like, you know, research. So I think that's probably the best thing we can do. So my job for you is to go tell people about frogs and tell them, you know, why they're cool and what impacts they are having in their environment. So that's kind of the end result. And I think I'm out of time, but if you guys do have questions, I'd be happy to answer. So cool. All right. So we have a few questions for you. Hannah was wondering what color spectrum do frogs see? Okay, wow. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and say I don't know. Uh, I'm not super big on knowing like anything, like knowing a lot about like light and kind of the perspective of other animals. I'm sure there's a decent amount of research done on it, but um, I'm really sorry, Hannah. I don't think I can answer that question. Um, but I'll and I'm gonna go back and do my own research and figure that out myself. So sorry, I didn't know that one, Hannah. Um, the next question is, have you ever been poisoned by a frog and does it have the potential to kill people? Okay, that's like a really good question. So um, I have been poisoned by a frog before. Uh, so there's, I, I did my undergrad, I was in college in Florida, and there's an invasive species called a Cuban tree frog. And they're not supposed to be there. Again, they're from Cuba, they're native Cuba, but they're, they're introduced to the United States um, years ago. And um, I, I collected this frog outside my dorm. And I, you know, was touching it, holding it. I was like, oh, this is really cool. And then I put it down, washed my hands afterwards. Um, and then I went to bed. And so I, as I went to bed, um, I kind of like itched my eyes a little bit. And uh, the whole night I couldn't sleep. Like my eyes were burning. Like I was very uncomfortable. I had to go like rinse my eyes out multiple times. And it was like super uncomfortable. And it was because these Cuban tree frogs secreted, again, a lot of like toxins from those granular glands I was talking about. Um, so some frogs have are very toxic. Some frogs aren't. You know, I wasn't at risk of dying, but even after washing my hands, like it was still very potent, and I was still able to like you know irritate my eyes. So that's an example of being kind of like poisoned by a frog. Um, but I wasn't worried about dying. If that answers any questions. You know, most frogs are harmless to pick up too. So I, if that helps you guys get an idea on that. Yeah. Um, from Miss Burry's fourth grade, Kaylee was wondering how long a frog can stay underwater? Wow, these are really tough questions. Um, yeah, I guess I don't really technically know the answer to that. Again, it really de depends on the species. There's some frogs that are completely aquatic. Um, there's this really cool group of frogs called like African clawed frogs. Um, they're in the genus Sinopis, and they can 
probably be underwater for hours and hours and hours. Um, and I think a lot of the reason why they can do that is because they can get a lot of oxygen through their skin um, via diffusion. And I think other frogs might not have those capabilities because they're more terrestrial, right? So like toads probably couldn't be actually underwater for as long as those fully aquatic frogs could be. Um, so I think it really just depends on the species. Um, some, I would say more of your fully aquatic frogs can stay in water for super long periods of time while more of your terrestrial frogs probably couldn't. And from Sycamore Trails Elementary, what's the most common colorful frog? Most common colorful frog, I would say, um, man, that's a hard one too. I would say common on the, on the internet, probably dark frogs. Um, those are, when you think of color, people always talk about poison dark frogs or people always have pictures of poison dark frogs. A lot of poison dark frogs are really popular in the pet trade. I personally have some poison dart frogs in my, like I have some frogs in my, um, you know, personal collection. Um, but that would probably be my answer. I don't know if she was talking about the wild or um, online. I also, real quick, I forgot to show you guys, but I do have one of my pet frogs right here. This is a white tree frog. I thought I would show you guys at the end of the presentation, but these are, these are that one species I was talking about can, they can be really well, they can do really well in droughts, um, despite them being, you know, um, a tree frog, I guess, but this, I don't know if you can see him. He's a pretty cool guy. There you go. Okay. Um, Madison would like to know what are the frogs predators? Yeah, that's a really good question too. So in most scenarios, um, it really depends again on like the environment they're in, what pressures they, um, are kind of dealing with. I would say for most frogs, um, probably a lot of the aquatic frogs, probably fish are going to be your biggest predator. Again, a lot of tadpoles um, that are developing into frogs get preyed upon by fish. Um, so I would say fish are probably the biggest predator frogs, but also like mammals can eat frogs like raccoons and possums. They'll, they'll grab frogs and start eating them. Um, birds can eat frogs. So there's a wide variety of um, animals that eat frogs. Also snakes. Snakes are also a lot of uh, a big predator in terms of like eating frogs too. So it really depends um, on lo location and like what type of actual predators are out there. Um, so that's that's my answer. Okay. And then our last question for the day is Daniel. And he'd like to know how many eggs approximately a frog can lay. Man. Okay. So this is again, one of those questions where it depends on the species, but um, there's some species that can lay as few as like a few eggs um, per female, but then there's other species that can can lay like hundreds and hundreds of eggs, like up to like a thousand eggs. Um, so it's really, really variable. Um, I think maybe on, there's kind of like going back to like your typical frog, I would probably say around 200 or 300, even up to like 400. Um, there's probably like, that's probably a good average for like how many eggs can be in like one clutch. But again, not all those frogs make it to adulthood. So the frogs need to produce a lot of eggs um, so that by chance, a few of those eggs actually make it into the wild. So that's kind of why we see a lot of eggs associated with frogs because um, they're a lot harder for them to survive due to like all the pressures that they have with predators. Um, so that's that's kind of what I'm thinking there. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your time, Owen, and for the great presentation. We really appreciate you volunteering your time to our project. And then for all the participants, thank you for participating. And you can also join our next Zoom from Frank, Frank Sladek, who works for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Once again, thank you, Owen, so much for your time. Really enjoyed your- Thanks really for having me. I hope you, get, hope you guys learned something. That's my, that was my job. So, all right. <laughs> thank Have you. A good one. Thanks, guys. Bye.